Hello and welcome to the Roman Chronicle, Episode 1, Troy Reborn. The Roman foundation myth has its roots in that most famous of all poems, the Iliad. The Romans throughout their history imagined themselves not ordinary people, but the descendants of the Trojans, chosen by Jupiter himself to fulfill a great destiny. The origin of this vision is the epic tale about the journey of a Trojan hero Aeneas and his band of refugees. This legend connects the mythical founders of Rome to the heroes of the Trojan War and gives credence to the vision of Rome as Troy reborn. Aeneas' journey is described in the Aeneid, an epic poem composed by Virgil. Virgil was tasked by Emperor Augustus with writing a sort of official telling of the story. He did not invent the plot wholesale, but compiled a collection of well-known legends into a classical poem. A lot of events in the narrative are presented as foreshadowing of different milestones in Roman history, such as the Punic Wars and the rise of Augustus. The Aeneid uses established Homeric heroes and plotlines to weave a story that prophesizes the greatness of Rome. In modern terms, you can call it a state-sponsored fanfiction. But it's not just a later Roman invention to embellish their history. King Pyrrhus thought himself fighting the continuation of the Trojan War when he invaded Italy, and Hannibal, before his famous campaign, had made sacrifices to Juno, who was a rival to Venus, a patron goddess of Rome. So knowing this story is helpful to understand how both Romans and their enemies viewed themselves in the grand scheme of things. The events of the Iliad begin with the beauty contest between goddesses Juno, Minerva and Venus, and end with Troy being sacked by the Greeks. The Aeneid picks up at the end of the Iliad and follows Aeneas and his band of refugees on their quest to find a new homeland. Its protagonist, Aeneas, is the son of a Trojan man, Anchises, and Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Aeneas's goal to re-establish Troy is opposed by the goddess Juno, the wife of Jupiter. She holds a grudge against the Trojans, because Paris, a Trojan, has judged Venus more beautiful than her. The hero and his followers set their sail from the burning ruins of Troy and journey towards the Balkans, Carthage, and finally Italy. Aeneas makes his first stop in Thrace, where he is immediately betrayed by the local king Polymnesto. He then visits the shrine of Apollo on the island of Delos and receives a divine order to sail for Italy. Aeneas misinterprets the words of Apollo at first and starts building a settlement on Crete, but later wisens up and continues the journey. He and his band sail around the Peloponnese and winter on the island in the Ionian Sea. The following spring, Aeneas ventures to consult the oracle and receives an addendum to the prophecy. To found a great nation, he has to settle not on the eastern coast of Italy, but on the western. As the adventurers sail around Sicily, the goddess Juno makes her move to foil their plans. She asks Aeolus, the god of wind, to blow Aeneas' ships off course, so they end up on the shores of North Africa. On these shores, they meet the Phoenician settlers and their leader, Queen Dido. Dido and her followers were refugees like Aeneas and his band. They fled from the city of Tyre on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, when Dido's family came into disfavor with the local ruler. Through divine intervention and her own cunning, Dido had led her people to North Africa and secured the land to build a new city. According to the legend, Dido had asked local Berber king Yarbas for only as much land as can be covered by an ox hide. The king agreed, so Dido cut the hide into fine strips and encircled with them the whole of a nearby hill, which became the location of the city of Carthage. Now the deities continue to play their games with our heroes. Venus does not want her son to fall into harm's way, so she makes Dido fall in love with Aeneas. Juno is conflicted about the whole affair, but eventually agrees. At least, if he stays with Dido, Aeneas is not going to fulfill his great destiny and re-establish Troy. While Dido and Aeneas are on a hunting expedition, Juno summons a thunderstorm that makes them seek refuge in a cave and spend a night together. 
but Dido is promised in marriage to King Iarbas, who is also a son of Jupiter. Iarbas prays to his father to send Aeneas away, and Jupiter answers his prayers. Aeneas is told to remember his duty, so he leaves Dido and continues his journey. Dido could not bear his betrayal. In a fury, she builds a pyre with the pretext of burning Aeneas' belongings, but steps on it herself. With her final words, she curses the Carthaginians and the descendants of Aeneas with eternal enmity. Our arms, our seas, our shores opposed to theirs, and the same hate descend on all our heirs. By this time, Aeneas and his followers are on the way to Italy and can barely make out the glow of the distant funeral pyre. Their first stop in Italy is at Cumae, where Aeneas visits the oracle Sibyl. She confirms his destiny to found a great city, and accompanies him to the underworld, where his dead father Anchises shows Aeneas the souls of all his yet unborn descendants, including Augustus. Finally, the company arrives at the mouth of the Tiber. They are greeted by Latinus, the king of Latini, a local tribe. The king has been already given a prophecy that he is to marry his daughter Lavinia to a foreigner who will establish a great nation. However, Juno, who is always plotting against Aeneas, influenced Latinus's wife to arrange a betrothal between Lavinia and Turnus, the king of Rutuli, another local tribe. The war breaks out. Turnus calls on the nearby Etruscans to help him, and in the decisive battle between his forces and the newcomers, the chances are equal. To break the stalemate, Aeneas vows to change the name of his people, so the name Troy will not survive. Juno is appeased and lets Aeneas kill Turnus and win the battle. The hero weds Lavinia, founds a new city and calls it Lavinium, in honor of his wife. Since Latinus was killed in the conflict with Rutuli, Aeneas becomes the new king. His followers and the Latins intermarry and rapidly become one people. Thus, after seven years of wandering, the Trojan refugees have found themselves a new home. Virgil's Aeneid ends there, but our story only begins. The son of Aeneas, Ascanius, succeeds his father and establishes the city of Alba Longa where generations of his descendants would reign for hundreds of years. This city is where our story will resume in the next episode.